die scale science. Then Ryan will, uh, uh, Matt will talk about the modeling perspective. Okay, thank you, Toshi. Um, as Toshi introduced, I will be covering kind of the data perspective of the new grand challenge that will be uh, convening starting this year. Um, and the way that we are kind of structuring this talk is around three objectives. Is first to introduce the community to where we stand currently with multi-scale geospace understanding, um, and then to talk about the importance and the progress that we've made with data-driven analyses of this problem. And then finally, to outline the approach that we've suggested, um, and, and this will largely be subject to um, adapt to community input. And so that's the perspective that we'll take this morning. And just for a blueprint of the talk, we've structured this data perspective uh, around these three central questions uh, this morning. The first is, what is the current state of multi-scale geospace understanding? The second is, why is now a timely period for us to convene a grand challenge that takes a, and it places an emphasis on data-driven discovery for the MIT system? And then finally, what approach will our grand challenge workshop take uh, from this perspective? So to begin with the current state of multi-scale geospace understanding, I'd like to start with just an illustrative example using the field line current system uh, as kind of a emblematic of, of the relationship between large and small scales. So if we talk about these field aligned currents, what we default to is this picture in our minds uh, this, of this seminal study by Ayajim Rinpatimura in the late 70s that established these concentric region one, region two rings as the large scale model of field aligned currents. And so what you're seeing here is just looking down on a pole with the sun off to the top of the figure and you see during quiet and active periods these region one, region two field line currents. And this has kind of been our understanding of them uh, since, and we, we've progressed that understanding a lot in terms of understanding the characteristics of these region one, region two currents, and also their dependence on controlling parameters, such as the solar EUV, the F10.7, the, F10 the interplanetary magnetic field, and uh, solar wind conditions as well. But the, the thing that's changed and that is continuing to change is that we have additional data becoming available that allow us to really dive into what's happening in the fine scale dynamics. And so for instance, if we take a trajectory of a satellite such as the SWARM satellite mission uh, that's moving through these region one, region two currents and look at the field line current estimates from those, what we see is a drastically different picture from the large scales and so in blue, what you're seeing are the smallest scale field line currents that are resolvable by the, the swarm satellite. And then in red is a smooth version of that that only captures the mesoscale field line currents. And what you see on both scales is that there's a drastic different reality than this large scale picture paints of these field line currents. And what we find from this is that now we don't understand the characteristics of these small and mesoscale field line currents. We don't understand their dependence on controlling parameters. And there's a third unknown that's been introduced, is that we don't understand the relationship between the scales uh, of these field line currents as well. And this is a problem and this is a challenge that is ubiquitous across geospace and, and within the MIT system, where we have these large scale models and a difference when we look down at the small scales. So as another example, if we look at our large scale model of the Aurora, this is the Ovation Prime output model. And you can kind of see this smooth uh, picture of the Aurora region uh, where we're not capturing many, much of the dynamics. But if you look at the small scale reality from something on the, such as a, a rural image from the DMSP spacecraft, we see a lot of fine scale dynamics going on here uh, that illustrate a different picture. Um, in the small scale reality. And so we have this new understanding and we also have new data available to study this. And so the question is why is now the right time for a grand challenge that really places the emphasis on data driven approaches. And to introduce that I just want to put up the picture that everyone's seen a million times of the heliophysics observational system. But I do think it does a good job of illustrating the fact that we have new instruments and existing instruments that are able to study every part of our interaction with the sun 24 seven. And so we have instruments on earth and in space that provide a wide variety of data, but also a growing volume of data 
to study this system. And what it does is creates this new data landscape that can be described as a big data problem. And I realize that's a buzz term, so really how we're talking about big data here is just in, in the context of four Vs. Um, so you have the growth in the volume of data, um, you have the growth in the variety of data, so this is especially relevant to our field where we have many heterogeneous diverse data sets. Uh, and so the variety of the data is, is really important to our changing data landscape. We have uh, ability or the need to understand the veracity of data. This is uh, how do we establish the uncertainties of the data, which is really important in terms of relating the data sets to one another and also fusing the data with the models. And then finally, the data velocity. How quickly are these data coming down? How quickly are we able to analyze them and actually provide or generate new knowledge from those? And so this is a, a drastically changing landscape. And, and the purpose of the grand challenge will be to better take advantage of the, the large and growing data resources that we have. And so in order to do that and, and, and understand how we've been able to create progress currently, I'd like to just highlight a few studies that have, have done this and that we'll be using to kind of design our approach for this grand challenge. And the first one has to do with the ionospheric flow channels uh, that have been identified. Um, so recently, Lyons uh, et al. produced a nice overview article of the abundance of flow channels that permeate the high latitude ionosphere. And these flow channels are extremely important indicators of magnetospheric activity and are critical components of the MIT coupling. And so you see things like the polar cap patches and polar cap arcs that are, have these properties and these dynamics and behaviors that are not well, are not well understood and um, are ubiquitous across meso and small scales. So one of the ways that this has been studied really well is by fusing different data sets together. And so just to illustrate that, Uh, this is a study by Zhu et al. in 2016, and what they did was bring together a large variety of data. Uh, so what you see here are all sky imagery data, ISR data, super darn data, and actually swarm data as well. So what I'll highlight here is this is just uh, this red circle here is uh, the data from the all sky imagery data uh, imagery. And you see these airglow patches that are propagating ac across the polar cap. This is the day side over here. And superimposed on that are super darn ion velocity drifts here. And you see that these airglow patches are associated with enhanced velocities of these, in these regions. Uh, one of the unique aspects of this study is that they were able to bring in the swarm sp spacecraft, which are orbiting through this airglow patch and this enhancement in the velocity. And what you see here, and what they discovered, was that these velocities, these polar cap patches, were associated with flow channels and localized field line currents. And so this was an important relationship between these polar cap patches and the dynamics that are occurring within the magnetosphere and the ionosphere system. And just a nice example of how these data sets can be brought together to create new understanding. The second highlight that I'd like to talk about is the relationship between this localized precipitation and the field of line currents that, and this is a study that we did uh, last year, and basically, just in simple terms, what we decided to do was take a, a data-driven approach, again using the swarm spacecraft, and try and understand how the data departed from our ability to model these large-scale field of line currents. And so what we did was establish a very simple metric that is essentially just taking the data, this small-scale reality, subtracting off what we're able to capture currently with our large scale models, and look at the degree of departure. Look how, how different the data are than, what, than our ability to model them. And so what we came up with was, uh, this is just one characteristic result from the study. Um, what we're looking at here is now the dial is local time, so the sun's off to the top of the figure, uh, but the distance from the center now is not latitude its difference, its degree of departure from the large scale model. And so what you see here, and this is small scale field line currents as measured by the swarm spacecraft, you see that there is a maximum across the day side in these differences between the small scale field line currents. And there's actually a local maximum on the night side in the pre-midnight region where substorms typically occur. And so there, there are these two critical regimes. And what we found was that these critical regimes match and correspond to 
density and thermosphere ionosphere anomalies and we call them anomalies because we are not able to capture them with our models and so we see this correspondence uh, particularly highlighted here for these key regions uh, and this is thermospheric neutral density now where we essentially the same same metric it's a degree of departure but now the data are the champ spacecraft measurements of the neutral density compared against a background neutral density model and you see that there are neutral density anomalies in these same regions where the localized field line currents are departing from our ability to model them. And so one of the questions is, are there electromagnetic energy inputs that we're missing from our models and our ability to understand this system? And this is a, what the data-driven approach has been able to uncover from this perspective. So looking further at the thermospheric response and, and realizing how these small and mesoscale relationships propagate from the magnetosphere through the ionosphere and even in, and into the thermosphere, we can look at this study that uh, was another data-driven approach that basically compared the data, the density data, to understand how the small scale field line currents might compare with that, how that might can be contributed to these density anomalies. And what we're looking at here are what the authors call the neutral density anomalies, and it's just the, the difference between the observations and a background value. So similar to this degree of departure metric that I introduced. And what you see here is that there's a maximum here in this cusp location, and also a local maximum in the night side pre-midnight regime. Uh, and these are across different seasons. So uh, this is, uh, I believe, winter, uh, equinox, and summer. And they also looked at the small-scale field line currents that were measured by the DMSP and the CHAMP spacecraft. And so these are on the 10-kilometer scale in this study. And you see that these locations where the small-scale field line currents maximize correspond well to these neutral density differences. And then finally, you also see a correspondence in the electron temperature that are observed by these spacecraft. And so this is a data-driven approach that's establishing a connection between these field line currents and different aspects of geospace uh, that really shed some light on, on the issues that we face. Uh, but they also raise important questions uh, of the challenges we face in trying to understand multi-scale geospace. So a few of these are, what are the characteristics of these small and meso scales? What are the feedbacks between the small, meso, and large scales? And overall, what is the impact on the global geospace system? And so this is something that Matt Zettergren will talk about in terms of the models, and I think is very important to study from the perspective of model data, model data fusion. And then finally, what I want to conclude with today is just how these unknowns dictate our approach for this grand challenge. And so uh, I'll just provide a brief overview of the approach that we have outlined to take, but I think it's, it's really going to be subject to the community input and kind of adapting to uh, how the community sees this problem and, and sees how we should address this problem. So from our approach, we have proposed to really address this through a coordinated and fused observation uh, aspect. And this is creating a network of data. So the specific data sets that we'll target initially are incoherent scatter radar data, imagery data, uh, the global navigation satellite system signals which provide critical information uh, at a high cadence and global context uh, of the ionosphere, and I think that they're heavily underutilized, will also quantify the impact of these different processes on the GNSS spacecraft. Uh, we'll in involve some uh, large-scale data from the SuperDARN and global SuperMag data sets, and finally bring in uh, satellite-based data as well. I think SWARM will play a, a large role in this, in this analysis. Um, this is really timely because it integrates well with a few things, programs, and missions that are occurring now and in, in the near future. So the CUSP Grand Challenge Initiative, they have uh, rocket flights planned for early next year and will be involving those critical pieces of small scale and mesoscale information from those. I believe there's a, an afternoon session on the CUSP Grand Challenge Initiative if those, uh, for those of you interested. Uh, the ICON and GOLD missions will be another critical source of information. And then finally, this increased access to space. Uh, as we move forward, we're going to see additional data coming from things like CubeSats. And so we'll start to, we're, we're going to try and develop tools that are able to utilize the data more effectively so that we can bring in these data, these additional on, online databases coming online uh, more effectively and more rapidly. So what are some of the challenges that we face in, in trying to do all of this? Well, I think the first one is, is the data wrangling aspect. And, and I think 
many people, if not everyone in this room, can relate to the fact that the data wrangling is often the most time consuming portion of the research that we do. Um, and so one of the things that's important is to better address this problem of reinventing the wheel, not, re, not redoing the analysis and the processing that, are, that people do already with the data, but involving reusability of our data products and our analysis tools will be something that's a, that's a big challenge and that hopefully we can help address through this data-driven approach. Um, handling the diversity of data, I think this is a really critical aspect. And uh, what I mean by that is how do you allow the data to be used with other data sources, uh, either other observations or models. And one of the important points of that is that you really need to be robust in your description and your quantitative analysis of the uncertainties of those data so they can be incorporated into the analyses. And this is a prerequisite for performing multi-observation multi and, and model data fusion studies. So it'll be really important to this data, this workshop. Um, finally, creating apparent, available and transparent analysis tools will be really important to create the interdisciplinary research that we hope to, to foster through this Grand Challenge workshop. And it's really conducive to more rapid progress in this problem, addressing this problem of reinventing the wheel. Uh, so just with a, a, the final thoughts here is just we, we are proposing to take kind of a data science paradigm to this. And what I, what I mean by that is addressing the complete life cycle of data. And that involves everything from the data acquisition through the data processing and analysis, but also visualizing, communicating those results and providing the analysis tools as a, something that can be used by the community moving forward. And so this will be a key component of our approach. And what that means that we need are a really radically interdisciplinary way of looking at this. And that means we need to bring together expertise from computer science, from statistics and applied mathematics, and, and with the data, the domain aspect of this as well. Um, and so this is kind of a, a Venn diagram that's become iconic in the data science community where you have uh, computer science, applied math, and domain knowledge really contributing to what data science actually is. Um, so this is an open-ended question, so please bring your thoughts and ideas and help shape this Grand Challenge tutorial from the data perspective uh, today from 1.30 to 3.30. And then finally, I'll just conclude before handing the mic over to Matt. Um, we just very briefly overviewed our current state and ability to address multi-scale geospace from this data perspective. Um, we've identified how much potential exists in using a data-driven approach to this problem. Um, but I think that achieving success is extremely challenging and requires a community effort and this interdisciplinary approach. And I think the data science paradigm offers a potential solution and is something that we'll hopefully address with this grand challenge. So with that, um, I'll just mention that there's, there's a capability of creating a new frontier in these analyses at the intersection of traditional approaches and new approaches. Um, and we wrote about this in a commentary article late last year, so if you're interested, take a look there. Um, but with that, I'll, I'll hand over the mic to Matt, and I think afterwards we'll, we'll take questions. Thank you. I actually think that we should take a couple questions now for the data part, if people uh, have any questions. You can't really see. Oh, there's some questions over here. Can you explain this danger zone to me, the Venn diagram? <laughs> danger zone. It's a highway to the danger zone. <laughs> That's exactly I can try. Yes. Yeah, this danger zone. Uh, between hacking skills and the domain expertise. Um, I think from my perspective what this means is that uh, you don't, you're not really understanding the statistics of the data and the uncertainties of the data. You're not incorporating those into your analyses. So you're just kind of hacking something together, knowing a little bit about the system and then making interpretations of that. Um, so that would be my interpretation of that. Thanks. The uh, difference between uh, large scale and I think small scale currents early on. Um, I'm wondering if you could comment on how that difference depends on the scales you're actually subtracting. The, the yeah. So if you if you take more... kilometer scale currents versus 10 kilometer scale currents, or kilometer scale currents versus 100 kilometer scale currents, those numbers change here. 
But I think in the next one. Here, yeah. Um, yes, they do change. Yeah, this, we, this is the one. In this, in this figure, in the paper, it's actually uh, across different scales. So we, the background large scale model, we use the Ampere global field line current. So that's on the 350 kilometer scale size. And that's, that's what we use to subtract off there. We don't actually vary that. Um, but we do change the small scale reality that is what we start from. Um, and that represents different scales that we observe from the swarm spacecraft. So what I'm showing here are the small scales. These are 50 kilometer scale size. But we look at different uh, panels in this where we scale up from 50 to 150 to 250 to the larger scales as well um, and look at the difference as a function of uh, scale size. Yeah, the, the, in answer to your question, the magnitudes do change quite a bit. Okay, let's thank the speaker one more time. Okay, um, <clears throat> so my name is Matt Zettergren. I'm gonna talk about the modeling aspects of uh, multi-scale coupling. Um, I'm gonna focus on some uh, recent, recent studies, uh, advances that have attempted to um, describe the multi-scale problem or, or address it from the modeling perspective. And it's um, sort of necessarily a, uh, a biased point of view. These are um, examples that I feel sort of somewhat comfortable or, or, or confident discussing. So, of course, there's going to be more out there than, that, that I'm not going to uh, address. Um, I decided on the title slide to put just some sort of uh, visually appealing examples of uh, modeling studies at separate scales. Um, the, this is um, showing a simulation uh, from work I've done with Kay Despande of um, density structures inside of these uh, Kelvin Helmholtz uh, vortices. Uh, this example here is showing um, perturbations to the mesospheric oxygen layer from uh, one of Jonathan Snively's breaking gravity wave simulations. Uh, and these two particular examples are sort of tens of kilometers down to uh, sort of meter scale structure, not meter, hundreds of meter scale structures uh, in these. And then this is uh, an example of an equatorial plasma bubble simulation from uh, Joe Huba's SAMI model. And then from uh, Ertl Yeats, um, global simulations of hem hemispheric anisotropy. So sort of going from small scale on the left all the way to, to large scale. Um, the problem is sort of incorporating the influences of you know, one of these scales on the other, or, or maybe even deciding when, when that's important. So I chose to um, structure this first with a, a comment on how this relates to the, the, the grand challenge uh, uh, workshop theme as it's represented in the Cedar Wiki right now. Um, I'm kind of going to give a, a sequence of examples of um, attempts at w w multi scale modeling um, and, and then discuss a bit how we might tie things in with the data or how we have tried to tie things in with the data. And then finally, I'll talk a little bit about challenges and approaches. Um, but with regards to approaches, I don't know that I really have a lot of definitive answers right now. I think we need, um, you know, this is something we hope to develop from the, uh, from the Grand Challenge, the three sessions that we have at, at the CEDAR. Um, you know, in stark terms, when I think about uh, multi-scale problems, I'm, I'm a sort of local scale modeling guy. Um, so I, I often face uncomfortable questions like, so I, I'm, I've got a local scale, I'm basically simulating the ionosphere inside a box. And I get questions like, what do you do at the edges of your box? <laughs> Stuff like that. And it, it's, it, we, we do something and we think it's not completely awful, but the fact of the matter is, is there's a boundary there that's totally artificial. Uh, and then on the global scale, um, I, I'm not a global scale modeler, but I think an, an, a question that they often face is, okay, you have, you know, at best 25, 30 kilometer resolution. Uh, what do you do with all of the, the myriad scales, for example, at high latitudes that are below that uh, particular scale size? A typical roll arc might be one to five kilometers across or something like that. And we know that uh, represents a significant amount of energy. So those are kind of the, you know, in basic stark terms, those are the, the issues that, that we face. Um, I would argue, and I'm going to try to provide some examples, that small scale dynamics in some cases do matter to uh, the global scale. 
Um, large and small scale models tend to be operated independently. You can find some outstanding examples where they're not, but uh, as a, a general rule, it's actually quite challenging to couple, uh, couple models across uh, scales. And then this last bit is sort of from my own experience. I found that um, if you're trying to marry the data and the models in a, a sensible way, um, it, it can be a bit of an art. There are rigorous algorithms for doing data assimilation, of course, but um, for a lot of the types of local scale uh, data-driven modeling that we're trying to do, I, it's, um, you know, it really just needs a lot of work at this point. So we, we've, uh, Toshi and Ryan touched on a lot of the themes. We're gonna talk about uh, small and mesoscale precipitation. Um, there's a, a concern and an interest in small and mesoscale uh, IT structures, including the effects of uh, waves, acoustic and gravity waves on the uh, upper atmosphere. Um, and then um, ionospheric density structuring due to, for example, instabilities, gradient drift instability, Kelvin Helmholtz instability in the ionosphere, Farley Buneman instability, as Soshi talked about, is uh, important for determining global uh, conductance structure. So that's kind of um, how, how this is all going to relate in. So I'm gonna, I want to provide some examples that I'm kind of familiar with. Um, of uh, large, I've organized this by sort of large to small scale coupling, but the fact of the matter is, is most coupling processes are actually uh, two way. But the simple statement here is um, any type of instability which produces structuring in the, in the plasma is going to necessarily depend on background conditions. You need to know, for example, background winds, background electric fields, background densities and conductances. And one particular uh, process of interest that has been, I think Ryan touched on this a little bit, uh, but is the issue of uh, patch formation, polar cap patch formation and structuring. And the basic idea here is that you have dense uh, dayside plasma which gets drawn into this region. Um, I think John Foster showed yesterday some nice uh, TEC maps of the polar tongue of ionization, but it gets drawn into this region where you have um, basically the ionospheric foot point of transient reconnection. You have a lot of structured flow fields, uh, and this dense stasoid plasma can essentially be drawn into the polar cap in the form of these sort of meso to large scale uh, polar cap patches. So this is really you know hundreds of, of uh, kilometer scales. Um, Roughly speaking, anyway. So the interesting thing about this that couples it downwards is uh, the, the instabilities that take that are known to take place in these patches. Whenever you have a, a drift uh, along the direction of a density gradient uh, in the ionosphere, it's an unstable structure. And um, if I can see, play the movie again. The idea here is this is sort of a cut in the horizontal plane but the trailing edge of this patch can become unstable to gradient drift instability. And then once one instability develops, there's often a, a cascading process and you, know, you, you form these shear regions that can also be Kelvin Helmholtz unstable. And so you go from a structure which was fairly, you know, on this tens of kilometer scale, which was fairly uniform, to something that's fully structured and actually uh, has a lot of small scale structure that can impact, um, for example, GNSS phase scintillation is one uh, example of a, an impact of this cascading process. Um, another example, uh, this is work from my student, Megan Burley. Um, we had come across Sondestrom data a while ago where we see clear evidence of a very, very strong um, acoustic and, sorry, very, very strong gravity waves that are impacting the high latitude uh, ionosphere. And the best way to see this is, is really in this, uh, this uh, panel over here, which is showing parallel velocity uh, in the ionosphere as a function of uh, altitude and sort of north-south distance. This is kind of a meridional slice. And the idea behind this is you have gravity waves dissipating and also breaking in this region here. You see a lot of small-scale structure. Um, but this dissipation and breaking mechanism is a way by which you can influence the uh, background atmospheric uh, and ionospheric state. And in our case, what we found, what Megan found, was that you have a substantial impact of these uh, nonlinear waves on background ionospheric density. Uh, and this is just through dissipation and uh, impacting of the uh, electron temperatures, for example. So on the far right here, for example, the bottom this shows percent uh, density difference as a function of time and altitude. And you have of order 50% differences through the F region and topside ionosphere uh, just from this dissipation process. So Megan can explain this more in detail, but it's an example of a cascade to small scales and then a feedback to the, the larger background 
uh, scales. And it's very sensitive on, uh, this particular process is very sensitive on the presence of photoionization. Um, essentially the wave can modulate the, the, um, the electron heating and cooling in the ionosphere. And it's very sensitive to the amplitude of the waves as well. Um, Toshi already showed this example, but it's such a good one that I'll, I'll put it up again. Um, <laughs> So this is uh, another sort of small to large scale coupling example. So this is microturbulence, Farley Buneman instability is, uh, as Toshi mentioned, happening at the, the smaller sort of kilometer and less, 10 kilometer and less scales. Um, but it actually has a significant impact on the global ionosphere through this uh, conduit of electron heating. So this turbulence, it's widely known from ISR observations, for example, that it produces really strong heating in the ionospheric E region in the electrons. Hot electrons don't really like to recombine. So you have a feedback on the electron density there. When they get hot, you actually have, uh, I guess you would call that a, a positive effect on the density. So the farley beneman turbulence generally ends up in increasing conductance, and, and that's important. Um, you know, the threshold for this instability is about 20 millivolts per meter electric driving electric field in the ionosphere. And that's important for affecting the distribution, the global distribution of conductance. So this is without the farley buneman turbulence, this is with the farley buneman instability. Um, there's a huge effect in particular uh, in this sector here. So that's important for global MHD simulations because the conductance sort of plays a, a role of sort of shorting out the, the cross-polar cap potential. If you uh, think of it in sort of simple circuit terms, a, a high conductivity thing is, is tending to short out your uh, voltage source here. And that's uh, important for the global MHD simulations because it's been known for a long time um, that the cross-polar cap potential is a parameter that the global simulations don't do particularly well with. It's a global parameter. Uh, and, and really, the, the, this explanation of enhanced conductivity through farley buneman instability, as modeled by uh, Wilberger et al. here, kind of uh, provides an explanation which reconciles things a little bit with the observation. So another example of uh, small to large scale coupling. Um, this is just an example from my own work. These are uh, atmosphere ionosphere simulations following the 2011 Tohoku earthquake. This is sort of a, an upward coupling from the ground. Um, but what was observed from ionospheric TEC is actually a, a strong sort of semi-permanent depletion in total electron content following this uh, undersea earthquake. Uh, and we've attempted to model this based on um, forcing it in the lower atmosphere based on ocean buoy measurements. And the, the ocean surface displacements are absolutely huge. We're talking meters uh, following this earthquake. And that's an enormous source of uh, acoustic waves. It's almost an impulsive uplifting of the ocean. And what we found by simulating this very carefully and calibrating our sources against what was known is you produce these very, very strong uh, nonlinear acoustic waves that actually uh, you have acoustic shocks here and then you have merging of wave fronts here um, that can actually drive the ionosphere uh, downward into the north, cause it to recombine, transport plasma away from the uh, sort of epicenter region here. So this is another background modification by nonlinear waves that's uh, happening here in the, both the ionosphere and the thermosphere. Um, an example regarding joule heating. So joule heating has been a concern for a long time, and uh, it's very important for getting the global thermospheric behavior correct, is having a good specification of uh, joule heating. And an interesting study, and this is one of those things that, you know, I, when, when I first read about this, I, I kind of thought, wow, I, I'm surprised I didn't think of that before. But the idea is the, the electric field models used by most of the global models do only incorporate sort of the average background um, electric field, and there are variations about that average in sort of a random variable sense um, that are produced by what's going on at, at smaller scales. They're not resolved in the global simulations, but they're there, and they actually matter because uh, joule heating is basically the Pedersen conductance times the electric field squared, and because of the squared uh, dependence of, joule, of the joule dissipation on the electric field, these uh, variations matter. So this is just showing uh, joule heating input without the small scale variations and, and with small scale variations included um, through an empirical model based on, I believe, uh, DE data. Um, the net effect of this increased joule heating on the thermosphere is fairly significant. You get hundreds of Kelvin temperature changes uh, in the exosphere and you get uh, tens of percent density changes through the uh, thermosphere. So that absolutely matters from the, the perspective of modeling the global ionosphere uh, thermosphere system. Um, another example at smaller scales, I won't spend too much time on this, 
Uh, but this is something that uh, Christina Lynch and I worked on. This is a, a rocket experiment, and I'm attempting to show in this diagram all the, the myriad data sources we tried to pull together to do the mesoscale modeling. Um, so we have FPI essentially constraining neutral winds. We have uh, imagery constraining the electron precipitations and then visor data that are giving us the uh, electric uh, fields for the models. We put these through the models and try to model the royal current systems, but there's kind of an issue here where the um, scale size of the electric field that we're able to incorporate in the model can greatly impact the currents that we get out of it, which happen to be the thing of interest for this study. So there's a question here of how much smoothing is appropriate and, and whether our model physics is even relevant at the, the very smallest scales, which are probably alphanic. So another example of sort of multi-scale input. Um, one of the last ones I want to talk about, this is from uh, Roger Varney, another good example of uh, coupling across scales. And it's, it's an example of, of uh, multi-scale sc coupling, but also coupling across systems between the ionosphere uh, and the magnetosphere. Roger talked yesterday, one of the important aspects of magnetosphere-ionosphere coupling is um, ionospheric outflow. It's well known that the ionosphere serves as an enormous source of plasma for the magnetosphere, number one, and number two, that that plasma feeds back on the magnetospheric dynamics, uh, essentially because of mass loading and, and changing of uh, reconnection rates. So these are Roger's simulations from his 2015 paper of uh, outflow from the cusp ionosphere. This is heavy oxygen outflow. Uh, heavy ion outflow, i.e. O plus is what I'm trying to say, uh, in terms of number of flux and parallel velocity. His uh, energization region, so the energy for outflow comes from precipitation, it comes from uh, joule heating, but it also comes from wave particle interactions occurring at very small scales. And what he's done is parameterize the wave particle interactions in this narrow region here uh, to try to assess the effects on, on ionospheric outflow. You combine that with convection and you get this classical uh, cleft ion fountain where the, the plasma is energized and then swept poleward over the polar cap and then of course escaping into the tail and possibly uh, convecting earthward and ending up in the, the ring current depending on the, the speed with which it's ejected here. So it's an example of how a narrow region can affect a wide swath of geospace. And then sort of diving even deeper to what he's done, he's, he's uh, connected his um, ion outflow model to the multi-fluid LFM model, which can accommodate the heavy ion outflow into the uh, magnetosphere. And he's studying these uh, sawtooth oscillations. And again, this uh, problem of parameterizing the microscale physics comes up. Um, he has a pointing flux dependent parameterization, which is probably the best you can do right now, from my perspective anyway, for how you control this energization of the ions. Um, and nonetheless, there's so many knobs to turn on the parameterization, it's so poorly constrained uh, by the data, so to speak, that you can actually get a wide range of behavior out of your global magnetosphere depending on um, how you regulate this uh, wave particle interactions. There's a feedback here, the pointing flux controls the outflow, the outflow in turn control, mass loads the magnetosphere and affects convection and so on and so forth. So it's an example of a multi-scale model coupling and it's also illustrative of some of the problems that we face with trying to parameterize microscale physics. Um, it became, uh, you know, in my conversations with Roger and, and my own interest in the ion outflow problem, it's become pretty clear that the parameterizations that we use for outflow are completely completely inadequate for trying to uh, get a handle on the, the global ionosphere magnetosphere system. Last example here, um, the resolved gravity wave simulations from uh, Hanli Liu are, are an example of sort of pushing the resolution in a model to try to incorporate uh, physics that would typically be uh, grid scale and um, you know this is a, a very promising avenue you know just increasing the resolution and possibly physics in our uh, existing model and this is a good demonstration of the, the work that he's done. Um, I have here some challenges slash opportunities you know the, the you have the pessimistic version challenge the optimistic version opportunity um, but a lot of them center around the computational issues that we face when we're trying to do multi-scale modeling. There's a lot of data to be passed around. The computational requirements to increase resolution are rather extreme. Um, we can talk about these more. We should talk about these more in the um, Grand Challenge session. Uh, and then some approaches here, and we'll also, we'll put these up during our, our workshop and talk about them a little bit more. This is a slide from uh, UA Dang that's showing what they've done with uh, the GitHub model, trying to sort of embed nested regional models inside uh, global models as a way of uh, addressing the multi-scale coupling. So just to conclude really quickly here, again, this is a sort of biased representation that's sort of dependent on my own understanding. There are a lot of systems that are, you know, 
involving multi-scale physics coupling, and there have been some, you know, there's been a lot of progress, frankly, made on this, but there's still a, a long way to go, and I think, um, to me, I don't have any answers. I, I think some approaches are clearly very promising, but um, I, I think there needs to be a probably drawn out discussion on, on how we move forward on this. Um, and, and then the other, the thing that I want to emphasize in particular, so for this ion outflow problem, I think this is true for other sy systems and physics as well. It's very clear that we don't have enough data to constrain our parameterizations. Uh, we're, we're kind of stuck until that gets uh, addressed. So please attend our workshop uh, if you find this interesting and also consider submitting to our uh, AGU sessions and that's it. I'll take questions. Do we have any questions? Uh, yes, it's on. Um, uh, Jeff Love, USGS. Um, this is subject is completely outside of my domain, but I am just a little bit curious about these many scales and whether or not they're just going to keep descending to smaller and smaller scales. And if there's maybe a practical limit um, to the scale that needs to be resolved. So for example, users of GPS data might only require a certain level of, of uh, location accuracy, and that might help you put a cap on some of the uh, scales that you need to resolve. So it's about practical needs versus academic interest. Yeah, this is a good point. I think um, in many cases you can kind of throw up your arms and if you have the, the data you can just make a parameterization that fills in the small scales well enough so that you get, you know, so that you get the scales right that are relevant to your GPS data analysis or something like that. Um, I, I think that it's sometimes surprising that what, what's really striking, for example, about the farley buneman instability is that you have these uh, microscale processes that are affecting the global magnetosphere. I think it's often sort of surprising how the small scales can sort of feed up, and this is not something that you necessarily would, would guess a priori. Um, so it's, there's a discovery aspect to it, um, which is that we, we, in some cases, don't even know how small we need to go. I don't know if I can, um, you know, answer the question of uh, where do we sort of cut things off. Practically speaking, we have to, especially for operational stuff. But um, in many cases, I think it's kind of not clear where to draw that line. So. I have just a comment. Um, I think this is... Maybe I'm wrong. Um, Multi-scale um, challenge, coupling challenge. I think mainly it's a challenge to how to understand the physical process. For example, a long time ago, I joined a conference. Uh, the famous guy, Murphy, he's an expert in um, turbulence theory. He said uh, in the meeting, uh, the fair line current try to becomes filaments. This also given by Arfen, the filamentary structure. Why? It's simple, you have fair line current. If no other force, they have J cross B themselves. So they try to squeeze together. So it's a force make that happen. In reality, it's more complicated than that because we have other force. So for example, you talk about Aurora. Aurora, you see, how much scale size should be depend on how the E, e parallel generated, what is E field and the, uh, B field behave. So that's our physics question. Only we understand the physics question, we can understand the scale size challenge. Uh, for example, another example is uh, turbulence. Turbulence, in, in my knowledge, is a dimensional analysis. No physical, no dynamical interaction in the uh, theory. So that, that, therefore, the cascade, you can see inverse cascade, direct cascade, large scale to small scale, scale, small scale to large scale. However, can they happen? For, for example, small scale change to large scale you need a break some frozen condition locally. Can you do that? So all become physical questions. 
Say some bad comments. I, I really appreciate that comment, and I think um, one thing, I guess this is somewhat of a self-serving comment from, from me, anyway, is that we, we do need small-scale models and, and, and theoretical studies because they, they tell us to a degree what parameterizations are appropriate or, or maybe, you know, might be appropriate. So I think that I, I, would, I would agree with you entirely. We need theoretical and, and small-scale studies, uh, modeling studies, to actually supplement this, this uh, you know, the, these parameterizations and these attempts to couple across scales. So I, I definitely appreciate that comment. <clears throat> John, right, Kevin. Okay, I think the problem with smaller scales is they have a very different scale in time and space, and so they decouple nicely from the larger scales, and so making small boxes that simulate the small scales in reaction to the large scales is okay, I think. But there is a, uh, and, and, and of course then that means that when you're doing the very smaller scales, you're trying to figure out how turbulence is going to operate. And then you go back to saying, okay, the small scales are doing this to my transport properties, and I'm going back to uh, the large scales to fix that. The problem is the mesoscale, where the time scales get a little uh, too much uh, similar. Second thing is, uh, I think one of the greatest challenges we have is what we saw in the current structures that uh, were presented in, in the previous talk or the talk before. Uh, when you're having an average of one microampere meter square, and then the current densities are one order, two orders of magnitude greater than that up and down, we're barking at the wrong tree. We need to figure out urgently why these currents are going up and down. Maybe it's just alphane waves, but even if it's just alphane waves, it's a problem that must be resolved urgently because that's what determines an average. When you have an average that, two, that can be two orders of magnitude less than the fluctuations, you know you've got a great grand challenge. I think that may be the biggest one we have. Yeah, I definitely agree. I think that, um, you know, figuring out what's going on at the small scales and then sort of tossing that into the global models is uh, in some cases that's kind of fraught with complications, and you know, I don't, I don't know that you can um, necessarily develop a satisfactory parameterization that describes, for example, what gravity waves are, are, are doing to the upper atmosphere. Um, maybe you can, maybe you can. I think it is, as you say, a challenge. So, and I agree with you about the small scale filamentary currents too. That's another, you know feedback type of process that, that's cascading to smaller scales. Hi. I, I have a sort of question slash comment, and then I, I don't think I'm adding to the sense to make this optimistic, but it's really grand challenge that in, in the, from, uh, from the perspective of data science, you know, can we do data simulation on the meso scales? And then I think, uh, you know, looking at, for example, uh, tropospheric data simulation example that, that it relies on this balance, existence of balance to bring all different t data together. For, for example, geostrophic balance that exists in a, in a uh, synoptic scale uh, meteorological systems. And then in our example, that is, I think, ele electrostatic assumptions and then current continuity and so forth. And then like, when I ac try to understand what's actually happening physically, it seems like those assumptions are breaking down. If you go down to meso scale and then small scale, for sure, it, it's transient phenomena. And then I think that's really, we, we try to bring a tool that works for the large scale, for the data science, okay, that we could do it. But for try to apply to meso scale, we have to do it very carefully. So, for example, if you actually uh, try to ignore the just balance and then creating small scale gravity waves, and the tropospheric data simulation community spent quite agonizing years how to fix it, and then they, they're still basically wiping, wipe, wiping out that effect. So no, nothing uh, comes up. To the actually to the to the our altitude because it's wiped out because that messed up their system, so anyhow so that's that's their problem. But then I think we have to own our version of it to move forward, and uh, it's it's lots of opportunities. But it's it's a it, we have our own sort of challenge that we have to go back to fundamental physics. So it's it's a data science, data simulation given an opportunity to make this science uh, field be more applicable to practical application, but we have to actually go back to 
uh, fundamental physics to, to, to look in deep into this. <laughs> so. Yeah, I agree. The resolution you're modeling at will determine what your mathematical model needs to be, which then affects the numerical complexity and feasibility. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, I do see a few more hands up, but we're, we're out of time now, so let's thank the speaker one more time. Thank you. There's clearly a lot of interest in this, uh, in this arena, and so I encourage people that are, uh, had some questions that weren't answered to, to go to the three sessions that are scheduled throughout the, uh, the week. Uh, before we go on break, um, I'd like to invite Rob Pfaff up here. He has some information that I think is important for the community to know about. Is that going to work? Hopefully. Everyone, it's with um, a heavy heart that I share with the CEDAR community that uh, we've lost one of our leaders, uh, someone who was a true giant in the field, and that is Mike Kelly. Um, yesterday I received an email from Mike's older son, Scott, saying that Mike passed away on Saturday. He was surrounded by his family. He had complications from liver disease. As you, as you know, Mike was one of the founders of CEDAR. He was a CEDAR chair. Many of you know him from his text book. And I'd like to ask if we could maybe have a moment of silence. Maybe we could stand and just for a moment and uh, remember Mike. Okay, thank you. I, I intend to uh, tell Mike's family that we remembered him at Cedar. Of course, there'll be obituaries and things coming later, but since this was so recent, I thought it was appropriate to uh, make the announcement. And I thank John. And Mike's legacy will live through his science and his students and the impact he's had on, on many of those in this room. So thank you. Um, we'll be on break now, and we will reconvene at 10 o'clock.